Okay, so, so I want to talk about Wolfram language, which is um, something that I have been basically working on for about 30 years, building this technology stack that has, uh, uh, among other things, kind of uh, had Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha as kind of waypoints in this journey. Um, the, uh, uh, what, what I wanted to particularly talk about today, I want to talk about Wolfram language, show you some of the things it does, uh, talk a little bit about using Wolfram language as a way to provide a means for a much broader range of people in the world to do something that one might think of as programming than has been possible before. So kind of the, the notion in Wolfram language is we want to make the highest possible level language that we can. We want to make a language where as much as possible is built in, as much as possible is automated, and we call it a knowledge-based language because the idea is that the language itself should already know a lot of things. It should know a lot of stuff about how to compute things, a lot of stuff about data about the world, and uh, should the, the, so that sort of the human who's using it can start with kind of the knowledge of the world built into the system and then start building the things that they want from there. So I might say that, that the things I'm, I'm going to show you, you can actually just go to the web and... Uh, Try try any of this stuff out, but I'm going to I'm going to use the um, uh, let me let me actually start this again just to get a fresh start here. Um, okay, so let me launch this on the desktop, and um, there we go. Okay, so what I want to do, I'll just start showing you some of the things that Wolfram Language does, and kind of the the simplest mode of using it is just you type interactively into a Wolfram language notebook and you type a, a input, it generates output. There are other modes of using it that are more kind of computer systems oriented, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for, for a little while here. So, you know, we start off with the, the standard 2 plus 2, so to speak. Uh, you know, we go on with the standard, uh, you know, whatever simple computation you want to do here. Um, the idea of the language is be able to manipulate any kind of thing you want. So, for instance, a uh, typical kind of place to start might be let's, um, let's manipulate some, uh, you know, some graph. We have um, a graph, 200 nodes, 400 edges, it's random. Pick up the graph, we can do our computations on this graph. You know, break it into communities, whatever else we want to do with the graph. And we're just picking up a graph and using it as data that we manipulate. Um, we can do the same kind of thing. Uh, well, let's, let's just uh, to see some simple things. Let's, let's do pick up an image, for example. So, you know, I can take a picture of myself. Um, there we go. And uh, now I could, for example, say, well, I can do the easy stuff, like I could say, you know, edge detect that picture. Um, and let's pick up that picture, edge detect it, oops, and uh, there's the result. We could we could make that edge detection be you know we can we can go ahead and make that thing dynamic. Um, we could say dynamically edge detect the current image, or we could say something like um, there we go, and then we now we'll be we'll be um, doing this in real time. And what happened to my mouse? Where is my mouse? I, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, okay. I found the mouse. Um, okay, let's, let's stop it doing that. All right, so so maybe we could take, let's take this picture and let us go ahead and do something else to it. Let's take that picture and let's say we want to break the picture into little pieces. Um, let's say, you know, we break it into size 10 blocks. Okay, there's oh, let me get this a bit wider. Um, there we go. That's the that's that picture, um, a sort of a, an, an array of um, uh, pixel elements. Now I can do all kinds of things with these pixel elements. I don't know. For instance, I might say, you know, sort those um, pixel elements, and now assemble the thing uh, as a um, as an image. And maybe I could take those pieces together. So I could say, image assemble of uh, uh, sort of image partition, um, and I'm just sort of putting together the things that I was doing before of current image, comma, whatever it is, 10 or something, uh, let's say 15 here, whatever, um, and now let's make this be dynamic. 
And now what I should have is something where I've got a dynamic version of this thing that's assembling things out of those little pieces, okay? So it's pre pretty easy, you just, um, uh, you know, you take these things that um, support all sorts of different kinds of image processing and so on, and you just put them together to, to do computations. So we can, you know, we can start doing other kinds of computations. We could say, um, uh, let's, let's take some textual data. We could say, for example, let's take something from Wikipedia. Let's take, uh, let's just take whatever the, um, uh, the Wikipedia entry for Stanford is. Okay, here we go. And now we could say, for example, uh, uh, you know, let's make a word cloud out of, um, uh, let's delete the stop words to make it more interesting. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, and make um, a word cloud out of that. Oh, come on, wake up, there we go. Um, okay, so that just gives us a word cloud from that uh, grinding up that Wikipedia entry. Um, so we could do all kinds of things. I don't know, let's, let's just do some things where we, we play around with, um, uh, let's say we would get a word list from English, okay? So this is going to load in, I hope. Yeah, there we go. So it just loads in 40,000 words of the common words in English. And we could say, for example, let's go ahead and say, um, just get the length of every string here. And let's, for example, make a histogram of the length of every string in, this, um, in, in, in English. And so that's, that's what it would take to do that. Or we could do something, let's do something more, more interesting. Let's go, let's go ahead and get the um, uh, uh, first letter of every, of every word. So let's say the word list. We say take the, um, uh, let's see if that works. Yeah, so that will get the, the, the first letter of every word there. And now we could, for example, say, let's count the number of times each first letter occurs. And now we could, uh, we could for example, say, let's make a bar chart of, um, uh, let's see, we can say, I don't know if that's, yeah, it looks like it is sorted already. Let's say a bar chart of that. And then we say chart, oops, chart labels, chart labels to automatic. Um, and now what it should do, oops, what did I just do here? Ah, I did something crazy. Well, let me do this again. And then, uh, okay, here we go. So, okay, so there we go. So that, that's giving us a, a plot of the frequency of each first letter in, um, uh, uh, in words in English, okay? So, so kind of the, the thing I'm sort of starting to show you is roughly what's involved in kind of uh, uh, doing things in this language and, um, uh, and exploring different kinds of, kinds of areas. So a big, a big feature of the language is um, the, the fact that it knows things about the world. It doesn't just know abstractly about sort of uh, computational algorithms. It also knows things about the world. So if I say, you know, if I say something like Stanford, California, it will probably uh, recognize that that's a city and there's a thing that counts as a city. Okay, so we say, what's the population of that? Um, and it will hopefully tell us some number of people. Um, or for example, I could say, you know, Stanford University, um, probably, uh, uh, and it would probably know. We could say, uh, what do you know about that entity, which is Stanford University? Um, and oops, uh, um, and so it'll probably tell us all kinds of things that it knows about um, uh, about Stanford University. Okay, there's the the seal of Stanford University. All those kinds of all those kinds of fine things. Um, so uh, now we can go ahead and um, uh, yeah, all, all sorts of random stuff that it knows. Um, the uh, I think it's kind of interesting that it's in scientific notation there by default. The, um, it, uh, so, okay, the, the, then um, uh, we could say something like, um, uh, so, you know, lots of kinds of things. Let, let's say we want to do something like, um, uh, let's say, countries in uh, Europe, for example. Okay, so now it will be, um, it will give us something where we say, What's a list of all of those entities? Um, okay, the yeah. Flow, but there's tuition. There's about eight or ten listings of tuition, which are mostly the same number, but in lots of different representations. Do you That's know really what weird. might inspire it to use scientific versus? 
I have no idea. That looks wrong, doesn't it? I, I, I wonder what's happening there. Let's see. Tuition, local, undergraduate, local currency. Um, tuition, ah, original currency versus local currency. That's what it is. So it knows, it did a conversion. Um, it knows my local currency, and it was converting, in this case not very excitingly, from dollars to dollars, so to speak. And okay. that's, that's why it did that. Yeah, I was wondering why in some cases it's all spelled out. Sometimes there's a penny, sometimes a scientific notation. No, I think the answer is that, it, that, that in one case it lost precision probably because it was doing a conversion to from dollars to dollars. Yeah, thank Not you. very exciting, but um, uh, the... Um, I suspected there was a reason. <laughs> yeah, it usually is. But, um, uh, okay, so, so, and by all means, by the way, please, please interrupt. This is, um, uh, yes. If you change one of the previous items that a subsequent item depends on, will all the subsequent items regenerate? Uh, if you if you tell it to do that, yes. Okay. Um, I mean, it's um, uh, th this notebook. This is this is a notebook that you know we can we can go and start annotating it. We can say you know make a histogram here, um, and this is a you know very flexible mechanism for for building things. I mean, like for example, let's say um, I mean this is a technology that we developed twenty seven years ago now um, that I think people are kind of. Uh, the word notebook that we kind of invented for this is starting to get used by the people now. Um, it took more than 25 years for that to happen, which I think is sort of shocking because it's kind of an obvious idea. Um, the, uh, uh, but then you can, um, I mean, let, let's take something, uh, yeah, you can, you can have it uh, riffle through and recompute things based on what we had here, or you can... Uh, do do each each piece separately. Let, let's let's just as an example. I don't know where's a good good thing we could do here. We could say, um, uh, well, you can always make interactive stuff too. So, for instance, let's say we had gone. Um, let's say we went up here. How about we do this? Let's say we say manipulate uh, edge detect this comma radius r, r from 1 to 30, something like this. This will now give us a, um, an interactive thing that will, in this case, not do anything terribly exciting. But um, actually, we can probably make this more interesting. If we make this, let's try doing this. Let's try saying something like, um, uh, let's try, we could, we could make um, a table of edge detections here. And um, uh, so let's say we make this into a table. Um, let's not go quite that deep. Let's go 10 or something. Okay, so there's there's a bunch of edge detection pictures, and now we could, for example, we could say image 3D, and that will probably uh, succeed. Okay, there we go. So it just stacked up those edge detections um, into a 3D image, which we could then use all sorts of, you know, we could use some computational geometry stuff and print this or whatever else we want to do. Um, so... Let's see, we were talking about kind of um, thing. Okay, so there's a, a list of um, countries in Europe. So let's say we say something like, um, uh, let's say, entity value of that. And we say something like, give me an image of the flags of all those countries. Okay, so there's an image of the flags of those countries. And for example, I might say, let me show me a, um, a chromaticity plot in 3D of Let's see what this does. Okay, so that shows us the um, uh, what the distribution of colors is for the, the flags of countries in Europe um, from this. Or we could, for example, let's say we do something like, I mean, we know lots and lots of stuff about countries, but let's say we say something like, where was our list of countries? Um, somewhere back here, line 10, um, was our list of countries. So we say the list of countries, and let's say we say population of each of those countries. So we'll know that those populations of those countries, and now we could, for example, use those populations together with the flags. They were on line 14. And we could say, for example, make an image collage of the population with the uh, flags. And now what this should do is to make, make a picture where the, the um, collage shows the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the flag in a size that corresponds to the, uh, the population of that country, okay? Can you list the source of the curating data? Uh, yeah, if you go, I mean, uh, so for example, if I say, go to country data, 
Nobody ever asks us, you know. People, people ask, can you? And if the answer is, the answer is yes, but I'm just, just to prove that that's really true, let's actually do it. Country data source information. There it is, okay. Here we go. So there's, um, there's, there's basic data for, uh, for countries, mostly uh, UN. Actually, I think this is for a lot of stuff we have now, um, uh, is also from national census bureaus that hasn't flowed through completely through the United Nations, um, but that's you know that's that's the basic answer is. So you can use this as a citation engine in a sense. Yes, if you wanted to. I mean, but every individual number may have come from many places. I mean, this is not a you know we see ourselves as being a bit like an encyclopedia. You know, you go you can cite the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's a it's a source where somebody actually took the trouble to put their stamp on it and say you know this is something. Uh, we believe is right, and that's. <laughs> of those, I'm yeah. sure it's not for that yeah. type of thing. I mean, the the you know we use Wikipedia as a it's a great source of folk information. So, for example, if we want to figure out um, what you know what the common name for some particular thing is, or what possible name something is known by, it's a great source for that. Um, it's not a particularly good source for systematic data. I mean, what we've tended to do is, you know, we kind of drill down and find the primary providers of data and make arrangements with them, and then that's where we get the data from. And, uh, you know, we've done that for a few thousand domains, and it's a big sort of consistent pain in the neck to keep all this stuff current. It's often easier when the data flows in every second because then if the data feed breaks, then you know it's broken. If the data is supposed to come in every quarter, it's a little bit more challenging to make sure that really happens. Yeah? Of course, there's things where it's indeterminate, for example, is Israel a country? It's a point well, of view. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, what we have to do in, in all of these cases is we adopt some definition that comes from the UN or something like that, and that's what we go with. And uh, uh, you know, there are all sorts of issues, you know, even operating in different countries where we have to deal with, um, you know, differences in what people think about the world, so to speak. You know, an example that we ran into with Wolf Malfa early on was rabbits. So, in, in, you would think rabbits would be pretty international, right? Um, but the default interpretation of rabbit, uh, if you're in France, it's a food. If you're in the U.S., it's not a food at least not in the first, you know, first assumption. And that caused some, uh, some issues early on, as an example. I mean, there are, there are thousands and thousands of these things. Um, well, anyway, so, so let's, um, so there are all kinds of different uh, domains of data that we can deal with. So for example, I don't know, let's look at, um, well, let's look at, we we're talking about food. So let's talk about, um, uh, I don't know what, Oreo cookie, let's try that. Um, okay, so it's a food. There's some disambiguation there, which I hate to see. Oh, it's a food type, okay. Referring to a food brand name, okay, well, that's a food. Um, let me see whether we can get, uh, so for example, if I want to say, okay, that, that's actually showing a little bit of the ontology structure of the thing. It's food type contains exactly an Oreo cookie, and it has no, no added food types. Um, so I would imagine if I ask it um, entity value of um, uh, that food type, and let's say I say uh, vitamin A or something like this. So actually, I'll tell you what. Let me just let me just ask it to disgorge this kind of an uh, inefficient way of asking it to kind of disgorge the whole set of things that it knows about uh, an Oreo cookie. See what happens here. Hopefully, this one okay. So some bunch of stuff it doesn't have. Well, why doesn't it have any of that stuff? That's odd. It must have, um, it, you know what, it must be, this is, this is a, um, oh, it's a giant list of things it doesn't have, right. Well, um, the, there's a lot of stuff that it should have about, um, I think what's happened here is that this is a class of foods and it, we have to be more specific about what we actually want, that we actually want the, um, let's say, uh, well, let's try, um, uh, some random thing here that I don't even know what it is, but let's let's say oh it goes on and on. Um, uh, let's go back and look at um, go back to our Oreo cookie back here. Uh, oh come on, ah, there's a lot of stuff there. Okay, here we go. Let's pick up that um, Oreo cookie from there, um, and then let's say okay, let's see if we have like an image of an Oreo cookie. So, um, hopefully. Yeah, good. 
Okay, so we probably, I'm sure, for the for the specific Oreo cookie, we will have endless, endless detail about. Um, um, let's try, you know, manganese content per typical serving size, for example, for the Oreo cookie. Uh, um, oh, that's bad. Okay. Oh, that's because I asked it. Never mind. Okay. Never mind. Um, that's probably, uh, I want to say, um, and actually one of the things that will hopefully come soon is better auto-completion. No, it doesn't know how to do that. Um, okay, well, never mind. At least it managed to get an image of the Oreo cookie. The, um, so, okay, well, we can, we can, look, at, um, can look at all sorts of domains, let's say, um, uh, um, let's say, for example, some, let's take a human bone, for example, let's say a tibia. Um, so here we can get something like the mesh region for that tibia and start, there it is, oops, and then we can, we can start doing computations on that. So for example, we could pick up that thing and we could say, you know, what's the, what's the volume of that, uh, of that bone? Up, we could say that's because it's just the, it's just the surface here. So we can say, what's the area? of that, uh, what's the surface area of that object? Or we could, for example, let's try to live really dangerously, and let's say we look at, um, uh, let's do this. Let's say, get the thing that is nearest on that bone to the point 100, 200, 100. So, okay, so that's the point on the bone that's doing computational geometry on the shape of this bone. So it's saying, what's the point on the bone that is closest to 100, 200, 100? So let's say, for example, we just give that a y value here, and let's say we just plot that as a function of y from, let's say, um, 0 to, um, uh, to 400 or something. See what that looks like. Okay, so what this is showing then is, is um, that's just showing that you can compute, uh, you know, you can compute this geometry where it's, it's, taking, um, uh, it's taking that point in 3D space and working out where it is relative to the, to the bone and so on. Well, all kinds of things, and um, uh, all kinds of things that we can compute with if people are interested in some particular type of thing. I don't know, you can do, um, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of visualization and sound and graphics and so on. Let, let me show you, here's an example we could perhaps look at. Um, let's say, this is something actually not yet available to consumers, but if you ta take a, um, if you have a favorite animal or something, anybody got a favorite animal? favorite thing of any kind, a thing that you can make a picture of? <laughs> okay, so this is just going to do a generic web search um, and give us back, hopefully, a little data set of, um, uh, of pictures. Okay, let's take a look here. Let's say that. Um, okay, so there are a bunch of pictures. Let's try taking, I don't know, that guy there, for example, and let's say Let's feed it to our um, machine learning system and let's say do an image identification of that thing. Um, okay, that was impressive. It actually said it was a meerkat. Let's, let's take a look. We can just say image identify uh, all of those things on line 29 there. Let's see what it thinks each of them is. Well, that's really boring. It thought all of them were meerkats. Um, we could say, for example, let, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's, let's say, um, uh, image identify, um, and let's let's for example say what is the um, uh, for each of those images. Um, let's take all categories. Let's take the top two, and let's um, let's say top three, and let's ask it for the probability of each of the things in the top three. So then we go like this. Um, okay. Wow. It's okay. It's 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 pretty damn sure it's a meerkat in most of these cases. One of them, it thought it might be a dog instead, with, with probability um, 0.1. Um, I think these are... So, uh, so okay, so this, this is an example of a um, uh, uh, part of sort of our effort to kind of automate different kinds of algorithmic things. So we can just have one function that says, you know, identify an image, and it knows what to do. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Let's see. Well, we can just we can just line this up here. Let, let's do this. Let's just say um, label. Uh, wait, let's just use automation here. This is this is good. Four, four line, or just make it 
Okay, so there we go. So let's see. A lion. That one I thought might be a lion. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty low resolution yeah. image, so it's, um, I don't blame it for thinking. And it thinks, oh, that one's a pretty reasonable guess that it might be. Yeah, I think it's actually impressive that it guesses it's a meerkat without. <coughs> uh, um, I think by the time it looks like this, it's a little bit more obvious. Um, and then that one at the bottom there, it could be an eared seal, it says, with 4% with probability. Yeah, not so bad. Um, you know, I think one of the big things that we did in, in this image identifier is put a lot of effort into curating the training set. Um, I mean, that's probably the way in which what we're doing differs from what other people have done in image identification is that we have, because we have lots of experience at curating all kinds of data, we sort of used that, the, both the automation and the management processes for doing that, and applied it to image curation, just as we've applied these things to curating sort of socioeconomic data or data about chemicals or whatever else. Yeah. Can you do you have some process of using neural network for the so we, we have a, I mean, we've curated a few thousand domains of kinds of data about, you know, anatomy and cars and movies and chemicals and all sorts of other things. Um, um, first step is, you know, find the definitive source of data. Um, second step is, uh, you know, it's usually ingesting the data at the beginning is usually very easy. Making it computable um, is typically hard, and what one ends up doing is it's a mixture of automation, cross-checking against other kinds of domains. I found that, you know, if there isn't some human expert who actually really understands that kind of data in the loop, you will simply get it all wrong. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, there are some steps which require human curation, um, and there are other steps which can be done largely automatically. Um, it's uh, in the case of, for example, image recognition, um, that was a nice example of combination of uh, manual and automatic stuff where there's a bunch of automation and then there are the kind of the weird, weird corner cases and somebody has to look at the weird corner cases. The next challenge is you need to propagate up the judgment calls about those corner cases. Like, you know, is it a, is it a picture of a bat or is it a, you know, a Batman logo? You know, under what circumstances is it something, uh, you know, should it be considered, you know, a fictional character versus an actual picture of a, you know, let's say there's a meerkat cartoon. Should it be considered as a fictional character or should it be considered as a meerkat? And there's, you know, you have to end up trying to, it's not actually such an easy thing to figure out how do you make the, the correct, without uh, spending a lot of time on the part of a lot of people who shouldn't be spending the time doing that, how do you propagate those judgment calls correctly through the organization to the people who are doing, you know, on the ground data curation versus people who are sort of uh, in, in the back kind of um, uh, figuring out larger scale things. Yeah. yeah so this is so recognizing a category, right? So uh, would it be possible to recognize an individual within the category? Oh, would sure. Yeah, I mean, a, it, it's, a, I'm sure if we do, categories? let's just see whether we can do it. I don't know whether we can try. Let us try. This is now living very dangerously. I have no idea if this is work will work, but let's try. Let me look at it for a minute. And then let's ah, come on. Okay, let's try. I, I, this 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 is really living dangerously. Let's try. Um, I think there's a notable person classifier. Um, let's see if this works. Not bad. The, maybe there are only three people in here or something. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, uh, yeah, right. Um, the, no, I'm actually impressed by that. Um, the, um, it's, uh, um, so, uh, yeah, so, so the answer is, I mean, what's happened with this whole image recognition thing, um, we have a very general way of doing sort of machine learning with sort of meta algorithms for you feed in some data, we try and figure out what method to use. We happen to have built out a very very state-of-the-art kind of symbolic neural network framework, which will be coming out in the next couple of months, um, that would allow us to do our image recognition system, sort of would allow any user to sort of build something like our image recognition system easily. Um, and, you know, it can go from, you know, tens of millions of training images to, you know, training it on GPUs, to making a classifier, to having it sort of show up in the system, and all this is very nice and smooth. Um, and in fact, it's getting very much more efficient because we've managed to find, you know, feature vectors um, which are good for looking at images and so on, which we can then use to train subsequent 
uh, image recognition tasks. And we've done a bunch of, uh, I mean, just our generic classify function people have used to train all kinds of things, whether it's, you know, somebody's made a bird calls app with it, you know, other people, I know there's an insurance company that's doing insurance adjustment stuff with it, there's a pest control company that's doing the obvious things with it. Um, the, the general way that the classifier work, classify function works is you, uh, let's pick up an example here, um, you give it, let's, here's an example, so let's try, um, uh, let's do this, so this is saying, I didn't, I can get rid of that, um, so this is saying make, train the thing from images of day and night images, Okay, so now it's doing training. This particular case, it just chose logistic regression as its method. And now we could, for example, take that back where our meerkats were on line 29. Um, we could go and we could say, uh, let's do this. Let's say label, um, label those pictures with the day night of those pictures. Um, and, okay. That was pretty boring. They're all daytime pictures. Actually, just for fun, just to prove that it isn't sort of a, let's see what happens if we do something like, um, uh, let's see whether we say, if we say darken that meerkat by, uh, darker rather, that meerkat by, um, I forget exactly how this works, but something like that. Let's try using day night on that thing now. Okay, so. We could probably find out, it might be interesting to see, okay, now, now I have to do this because I've, I've got to do a, um, a table day night. Um, but just to, just to show how this kind of thing works, I mean, let's say uh, x from 0 to 1, for example, um, presumably it will at some, oops, what did I just, oh, 0 to 1, in, uh, let's say in steps of point 0.1. Okay, so there it, it went, you know, at some point it decided, okay, it's night now. Um, it didn't have a very big training set, so it wasn't terribly sophisticated, but that kind of gives an indication of what, what it's doing. So the labels don't have to be tied to the ontology then? Could they be? No, the labels can be anything they never could. Uh, anything you want. It's, it's, it, this is just, um, I mean, yeah, these are just, these are just strings here. Um, I mean, I could, I could make, um, uh, yeah, I could, I could do absolutely anything there. I mean, if, if we, you know, just to, just for fun, we could, let, let's say, um, uh, you know, let's, let's pick up some other data. Let's say we have, ask about uh, Mr. Van Gogh, and we probably know some of the notable artworks of, of Mr. Van Gogh. Okay, so let's just take, um, let's, let's just take um, uh, 10 notable artworks from Van Gogh, and um, then let's get, actually for each of those, let's get a, um, uh, let's get the, um, an image for each of those, so we're going to have 10 Van Gogh pictures, okay, and then we can pick some other, anybody got a favorite other artist? Let's try, um, anybody want to? Okay. Um, so let's see whether we have some artworks of his. Wake up, wake up, okay, there we go. So there's 10 Picasso ones, so let's say, um, uh, let's see, we've got um, uh, let's say line 45 goes to, well, I could, um, uh, let's just say van. I, I, I'll tell you what, let's, let's just make a, a red and blue for some reason here. Um, 46 goes to blue, and that, that will be our, those will be our labels here. So let's say um, I need to thread those, and then I need to flatten that. Um, okay, so this will now be our training set here. And then we can say um, uh, classify things with respect to that. And now, wake up computer. Okay, there we go. Also use logistic regression there. Okay, so let's now pick from the Van Gogh artworks. Let's let's go ahead and pick. Um, uh, let's have a a random sample. Um, hold on. Let's say uh, these things. So let's say we want a random sample of. Um, uh, let's say five Van Gogh artworks. Um, okay, so now let's get the pictures of those if we have them all. Um, okay, so there's five random Van Goghs. Now hopefully, if I go and use, I mean again, these are, this is a pretty small training set, so our expectations shouldn't be super high. But it was line 48, so let's say line 48, map that over these. 
Um, and okay, so it, it didn't get them all right, but um, uh, that's that gives an indication of sort of what the workflow is for training these kinds of things. Um, the uh, um, it's, uh, um, so okay, uh, so I, I was showing a few kind of um, a uh, few examples of some of the kinds of things that we can do. Um, let me let me branch in a couple of different directions here. One is showing sort of how you take this kind of thing and uh, uh, do things, for example, in the cloud with it. The other thing I want to talk about is kind of how you use this for education purposes and kind of uh, teaching sort of computational thinking and such like. So let's talk first about some practicalities about the cloud, for instance. Um, so we can, uh, so the things I've been running here, I mentioned it's in the desktop, we can go ahead and, uh, you know, if we want to, we can go to the cloud and we can just go, um, well, I was, I was starting to show you, you can actually just go to the front page of um, website, let's go to this one here, um, and uh, this is our open cloud, and so you can just say create a new notebook, and here you'll be, uh, sort of alive in the cloud, just computing things um, with this kind of interface. And we could say, you know, I don't know what we could, we could make some, some plot of, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing some education type thing here, you might make a plot of this, let's say A up to five or something. And now this will make, um, this will make something where it won't be as nice and smooth as it is in the, um, uh, directly in, on the desktop. Um, because it has to go back and forth to the cloud every time it uh, it updates this, but this is pure, you know, pure web browser. No, no nothing is happening here other than that it's in a web browser, um, and uh, you know, it's it's a standard notebook in here, um, just in in the web browser. But now we can also go ahead here and um, say uh, we want to have. Um, um, let's let's go ahead and. Uh, uh, what's a good example? Um, well, here, let, let me just show you some things that we can do with data here. Let, let's say we, we make use of geographic data. So we can know, you know, this is a position, and we can say, you know, something like, what's the geodistance from here to uh, Timbuktu, for example? Um, and uh, hopefully it'll tell us, okay, it's 7,000 miles to Timbuktu. Um, we could, for example, say, oh, I'll tell you what, let's, let's go back. Let's do another computation here, which might be fun. So let's say uh, capital cities in Europe, let's say. Um, so this will hopefully give us um, a, uh, uh, okay, so that's, that's the um, capital cities of Europe. Um, let's ask it to give us um, the geopositions of all of those capital cities. Um, and this will hopefully, okay, there we go. And you know, if we just say now we can say something like um, uh, find shortest tour. I don't know if that will work for the. Okay, there we go. So that now gives us the ordering of those cities that will be um, correspond to the traveling salesman tour for those cities. And now we can take. Let me go ahead and just say um, uh, what's the best way to do this. Um, that is the shortest or just close enough for your purposes? It'll be for this length, it'll be the shortest. I mean, we had a, a fine, actually an algorithm that was originally developed in Mathematica for finding uh, traveling salesman tours that does really well. Um, at this length, I mean, it can do thousands. And at that point, maybe it'll only be one of the shortest. But at this point, it'll be the shortest. Um, so now, uh, let's see, I think. Um, no, let's do this. Um, okay, so now I've got those. Now what I want to do is take these these coordinates. There's probably a slightly slightly smoother way to do this, but this will certainly work. Um, and I'm just going to reorder those coordinates like this. And I would then say, uh, let's see, those are all geopositions. Um, that, and then I say join to true. And what this will hopefully do is to show me, with luck, um, there we go. So now it shows me the traveling salesman tour of the capitals of Europe, um, which is, you know, it's nice. It's pretty, pretty straightforward to get something like this. 
Um, and obviously we've got you know maps of the world and so on, and we've got, I'm sure if I do a, a geographics of um, a little geodisc around wherever it thinks we are right now, um, uh, you know, it'll, it'll give us all kinds of local maps and we can compute things from this and so on. Okay, so there's a question. could actually uh, in real time change the projection of those maps. And sure, sure, let's do it. Okay, so let's make a, let's, let's say the projection is going to be more exciting if this is like a 10,000 mile radius. Uh, well, let's do 10,000 miles here. Um, oops, 10,000 miles. Um, so let's say, okay, so there's, there's the current disk, which doesn't look much like a disk, because it's, um, and now we could, exactly, yes. Um, and so now we want to say, make a geo projection, and there are many, many, many types of geo projections. So let's say, I don't know what, uh, a Lambert azimuthal projection. Okay, so there's the, there's that. And we could, um, uh, you know, just to give a sense of the type of thing that's in here, like those are the geo projections that are supported. Okay, so you'll find pretty much anything that um, I don't know. We can pick whatever. I've never heard of this one, a, a Karchenko Shabanova projection, but let's try that one. Not all of these projections actually apply to the whole cold globe. So, okay, that one was a little funky, but um, <laughs> the, okay, that's um, that's the way that worked. Um, but, uh, uh, okay, so anyway, the, um, uh, actually, that gives me an idea. Okay, so, so let's say we want to make an app, that, and that app is going to show us a picture of um, uh, the world, for example. So let, let's, we can make a picture of the world here easily enough. We can say um, uh, geographics with a geo range. There's nothing in the picture, geo range to all. Okay, there we go. If we go geo range, I wonder what happens if we go geo range to, uh, let's say, Mars, um, and uh, see what that does. Oh, that wouldn't work. Um, oh, I know what we have to do. We have to say this. Um, and that should give us, oh, there we go. That's a, oh, that's a random point on Mars. So I probably would, should say geo range to all, because that way it'll, it'll be the whole of the planet. Um, and, uh, uh, Geo model, so there we go. So there's the whole planet in that projection. We could probably apply the same projection stuff to this. So we let, let's say we say geo projection arrow, you know, Alba's projection or something, and that will now be an Alba's projection of the planet Mars. Um, I wonder if we have, um, let's see, what was some, uh, let's see whether we have something like that. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, see what that is. That's supposed to be, oh, it doesn't know where it is. Oh, well. Um, let's just see. Oh, Viking 1 lander or Viking 2. Oh, it thought it was the... That's pretty stupid, actually. That's the Viking 1 orbiter, which clearly does not have a surface location. So it, it points off for that. Um, the, uh, okay, so there's the Viking 1 lander. Um, okay, there's the Viking 1 lander with a geoposition on Mars. And let's go ahead and, and plot, just for fun, let's take that and let's... Um, uh, let's go ahead and do this. Let's say uh, there's a geoposition, and let's say geolist plot of that geoposition. Um, oh, great. It doesn't let me do that. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, there's no street information for the planet Mars. Um, the, um, let's see. We just want to point at that geoposition, and let's make it a, um, uh, let's make it a green point, and let's make it... Um, uh, large. Okay, well, there we go. So there's a there's the the point on that geo projection, the position of the Viking one lander on planet Mars. Okay, so so what I thought I was going to do here, just for fun, was to take um, uh, I was going to make an app which does geo projections. Okay, so uh, let's take a look here. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so what I can do is I can say make a form and make that form say, ask for a projection, okay? And um, then I want to give it, uh, uh, I want to say geo projection is, the, is, is what it's looking for. It wants a, um, uh, it's looking for a geo projection. And then what I want it to do is make a geographics of uh, geo range to all, which means the whole earth. And then um, 
let's say, a geo projection there is a um, is this is projection called projection there. Let's make that a function. Okay. So now what I want to do is I'm going to deploy this to the cloud, um, and this will now make a, um, uh, a little web app in the cloud. Okay. Um, and this will oh come on. Um, I think I have to. Why do I have to log in here? I shouldn't have to log in here. Um, I'll tell you what, actually, let me, let me, I'll make it, let, let's make this simpler. Let's just go ahead and tell it, um, so I don't have to log in. Let's just make this a public web app. Um, okay, so now this should go, there we go. So now we've got something which is asking for a projection. And now let's say, uh, um, this is a smart field. So it's a thing which, which basically will read natural language. And um, so I don't know, let's say, I think there's a thing called an Alba's projection. Let's go ahead and try that. Okay, so there we get a result. Or let's say, let's just say, let's say we have, actually, I'll tell you what, let me deploy a slightly different thing here. Let me deploy a form page and let me deploy something which says, um, uh, you know, we can, we can start um, doing, how about we do this? And we also do um, a city here. Um, let's ask for it as city. Actually, no, I'll tell you what. Um, let's just say a place and we want to say a location. Um, and I think what we want to do here is then say, let's center this map. Um, I think it is something like geocenter, is that right? Yes, is the place. Um, okay, so now what this is going to do is it's going to deploy a form that is going to ask us for a projection. So let's say something like, I don't know, uh, anybody know, a, um, let's say, mole wide, I think is a projection. Let's try Eiffel, oops, oops. Let's try uh, down here, uh, let's say um, uh, Eiffel. Well, let's say Timbuktu. No, let's try something. Let's try Sydney, Australia. Um, okay, so now what this will, should do is, okay. So that will, that will have made that projection centered. It wasn't so exciting. Let's center it on um, uh, Svalbard, for example. Um, that might be more interesting here. Uh, did that just do the, oh, okay, it changed slightly. It didn't change very much in this particular case. I guess it's just not a, uh, but, but the whole point is here, what we're doing is each one of these fields is a field that's using natural language understanding to figure out what the entity is. Then it's feeding it into that piece of code that we wrote here um, and, uh, and, giving us some, uh, and, and giving us the result. Actually, one thing you might ask if this, this code, you know, one of the things for our education purposes that, is, is, you know, the code is all basically English words. It's pretty easy to read in English. If you don't happen to speak English as your native language, um, then uh, 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 it, it can be more difficult to read. So we have at least a few languages here. So let's set it, for example, for Russian, um, and it should annotate that code in, in Russian there. Um, and that's sort of a, a convenient thing for, uh, uh, for education purposes. So, um, Let's see, so that, that's, that's what you can do if you want to make a form um, that does something on the, on the web. If you wanted to make that into an API, this may be super annoying to have this in Russian. Okay, it was a, it's a nice feature, but it's not such a nice feature if you don't know the other language. And um, uh, okay, let's get rid of that. Okay, so this is now going to make, um, uh, this is instead of making a, um, uh, uh, a, a form, this is making a, a, an API, and now we, we just have to say, so this API requires us to say something like question mark projection equals uh, Mercator, for example, um, and then ampersand place equals Chicago, let's say. Um, and now it will run that, that computation as an API. Oops, I didn't tell it, okay. It ran it as an API, it did a great job, and it produced a, uh, a, an output that is not very useful to us. Um, let's tell it we want the output as a PNG. Um, so now let's get that, get that um, uh, uh, thing again. Um, let's say we say projection equals um, um, Mercator um, place equals Chicago, for example. And now it should generate the output here 
as, um, as a PNG. Okay, there it is. Um, so this is something we can now take and include. If we want to include that in some other, other program, we can just say, give us the embed code for language. I don't know what, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, C++ C++ for Visual Studio or something. Um, and this will now give us uh, uh, all kinds of um, C++ code that allows us to call this, this external API. Um, okay, so, so lots, of, lots of stuff like that that one can do. I should maybe explain something about kind of the, um, uh, the structure of the language. And people have questions or comments, I'm happy to... to um, it seems very rich and powerful. Uh, what, in your experience, what has been the learning curve for somebody new to come in and become a reasonable expert? Well, you know, I, I thank you for asking that. I, I recently wrote a book intended to, to deal with that issue. <laughs> this, is a, this is a book that is intended for people who know nothing about programming, okay? Uh, if you, if you, actually, if you already know something about programming, there's like a 15-page fast introduction for programmers, which seems to get people uh, up to speed in terms of the principles of the language. Um, I mean, this book is intended, this book is, is uh, zero programming and essentially zero math. Um, so assumes only arithmetic, basically. Um, and actually, you can find this book online at... Um, uh, I, I have one data point. I had a very nasty uh, mani mathematical manipulation. I kept getting wrong by hand. It took me about three days to get it using the notebook online system a few years ago. So that was quite a while ago, but only three days, and I got the right answer. That's good. That, that's some, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I think realistically, so, you know, this is a, this is this book, and, um, you know, the thing, I just actually, two days ago, I, I saw a bunch of kids in this local area who've been going through this book and learning stuff, and they, ages about 11 to 15, I think, and they seem to have uh, uh, very successfully absorbed what it needs to, what you need to do to write not just decent, but actually rather good code in the language. Um, so, I mean, the, you know, the basic thing is the principles, although there are a fairly small number of principles in the language, there are 5,000 functions. It's like if you're learning a, um, uh, 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 you know, a foreign language, there's a certain amount that you can get. Uh, there's a certain amount of sort of grammar and principles of the language. And then there's a lot of vocabulary that you can learn to do specific kinds of things, to communicate about specific kinds of things. The advantage of this language compared to a typical natural language is that this language is kind of consistently and structurally designed, which our natural languages are not, so to speak. Um, well, that raises a good question because um, you also showed one of your languages as German. And if you put Wolfram in, is it your name that's going to come up, the language, or the element? Well, in, in, in which language? I mean, in... In, in German. In German. Well, we're, we're, so, okay. So we're not, we're, we're dealing with English language input, mostly. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, um, I mean if we, if, if we, if we so for example, here's a good question. I mean, if I say, actually, this is an interesting question. I wonder how many languages we have. Um, we know what tungsten is. And let's see. Okay, pretty pathetic. Not, not very many languages for tungsten. Um, I mean, we have, we have pretty extensive, um, you know, if you, if you have something like... Um, I don't know, hello or something. Um, you'll find we know that in lots of different languages. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, here here's not not a lot of um, uh, not a lot of languages right now. We we know what tungsten is in, in those languages. But if you ask if you ask the question, you know, if I type something in that is an ambiguous kind of thing in, in the natural language system. So let's say I type Stanford in. Okay. So what you'll notice happens is that there's that little dot, dot, dot there. And if I press the dot, 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 it will say, assuming Stanford is a university, uses a city or a surname or a given name instead. So, you know, if I say, use it as a given name, it will be, uh, uh, you know, it'll have a whole bunch of different properties and so on. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's how it does things. Can you scroll up for the hello? Yeah. So, so what is it saying? Uh, he, is he giving the... It's giving um, word language for word translation, translation of what it means. Yeah, it's giving word for word translation. I hope it's right. Tell me if it's right. No, for the Hindi one, it should say Namaste. It says it just says hello. <laughs> it, whatever you see in Hindi. Yes. It, when I read it out, that means hello. It's, Whereas in Hindi, really, it's called Namaste. I think that just did a phonetic direct mapping. 
Yeah. That one is, is to, okay, all right, so we have, okay, good, that's a bug, thank you. <laughs> um, you just have to remember that, that, uh, you know, this is the, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, language translation is an imprecise art, um, but it sounds like this one is just wrong. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm going to just excuse me. I have to make one <laughs> micro note of this because it's uh, recorded. You're okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, but I, I have to remember that. Um, <laughs> he also says um, that it's literally the definition of hello. Instead of saying hello, but he says um, oh, what you say to um, ask how you're you doing. Which language? Uh, Mandarin. Okay. All right. We're not doing very well on hello. Can I try one other word? Let's, let's see whether we do better on some other. Um, let's say something Try like uh, <laughs> cat or something. Um, yeah. Can we do any better for that? <laughs> is that is that right or is that yeah, also? Yeah, the cat on yeah. for Hindi is right. I think okay. It's, okay. It's, the Hindi one is correct. Okay, good. How about Mandarin? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello may be a more difficult case. <laughs> yes. What do you think of adding uh, a degree in programming languages like in Java to classes and methods to work? Well, so, so our world, I haven't really talked about the language structure. Um, you know, in our world, we're, we're a symbolic language. So when you have a piece of data, um, there are different ways to kind of uh, characterize what that data is. There will typically be some, uh, so you can have, in, in a language like Java, it's sort of an indirect thing. There's a class, and you know what class a thing is, but the thing itself doesn't have that class as a piece of its structure. Um, in our language, the actual, in many cases, the actual thing that you're dealing with structurally has something which characterizes what it is. So let, let me, let me. This is a slightly longer answer. I mean, basically, the way I see it is symbolic languages. You know, object-oriented programming is a is a small, is a, a, a rather elementary step on the way to what one can do with symbolic programs and symbolic languages. Um, but I have to, you know, I have to say a bit to explain what I mean by that. Um, so, I mean, let, let's start off with, you know, basic structure of the language. Okay, so we have x. It's just x. It doesn't need a value. It's just, you know, x is x. Um, so now, and, and like, you know, something like Stanford here, if I say, what is that? Um, it'll, tell, it'll tell me it's just an entity, a given name, Stanford, US, male, given name. Um, and so similarly, any, anything we deal with here, whether it's, um, you know, a, uh, something like a, a 3D graphic or something. This is all just represented as a symbolic expression that happens to be displayed in some elaborate way. Okay, so how do we, how do we, um, uh, how do we for example, uh, uh, define a function in the language? Okay, yeah. The cloud version of the language is free for everyone to use, right? That at least to do small things with it. Right. Yes, you, you, you can't do a thousand hour computation that. Free cloud. And so is there a free version on the desktop that you're planning to do at some point? There's a free version of a player on the desktop. There's, um, and actually, if you get a Raspberry Pi computer, for example, it comes with a free version of the language. Um, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a more complicated question. I don't really know the answer to that question. At, at Stanford University, it's free because Stanford has a site license for it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, th that... Um, uh, if you want to do it for free, yes. I mean, for Wolf Alpha, it's free for as many queries as you want. For, the, for our cloud, there's a limit to the number of cloud credits you can accumulate um, without, without having a subscription. The, um, so is there a plan for you to release a desktop version? for people to play around with that's not paid or like you know any of the other open access languages like Python and so forth? Well, our first step is to do, deal with the cloud. I mean, that's, that's, uh, um, that's easier for us and easier for other people because there's no installation involved and so on. Um, whether that actually hasn't been a, people haven't asked for that. I mean, they seem very happy with the, I mean, the, the, the free version in the cloud is very new and people seem very happy with that. And um, uh, the, the, you know, having this on the desktop is something, you know, in, in the academic world, it's very widely available. Um, uh, outside of the academic world, it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to meter that, so to speak. Um, and it's also complicated because what seems to be a desktop thing is also communicating with the cloud to get, get its data and so on. So it's a, it's a slightly complicated creature. 
I think data is key here because that's mostly what what would be of value in this platform as time goes on. Um, I don't know. I think the algorithms that we just spent the last 30 years building are probably have some value too. Um, <laughs> no, no. Over a long period of time, the more data you collect from various sources, like the businesses that you mentioned and things, people are sharing proprietary stuff with you. I think that'll be also of value. Right? We're not playing that game. I mean, All right. So, in, in other words, as far as we're concerned, if it's your data, it's your data. We're not. We're not doing the kind of what seems to be the the trend, which I don't think is going to continue because I think people are going to get upset about it, that, you know, what's that? It's a little advertising in the form of me to run an ad blocker. <laughs> there's no advertising, yes, that's right. And there's no, and, you know, as far as we're concerned, we don't, you know, we're not doing the kind of the, the typical cloud company of, you know, it's all free, but we, we get all your data type, type thing. As far as we're concerned, you know, we've been in the business of, I mean, you know, for the last 27 years or something, people have been using Mathematica to do all kinds of stuff with, you know, all kinds of classified data and proprietary data and medical data, all this kind of thing. It's, it's just not our model particularly to get to, you know, grab people's data, so to speak. And so, you know, we have our public cloud uh, where people, you know, can store their data. They can also get a private version. And if they're on the desktop, it's just like they're, they're doing whatever they do on their on their machine. Desktop is not the question. I was thinking more on the cloud side. Right. I'd be very interested to, you know, see how you and it's great that you think the data is. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't want people's data. It's. Okay. it's um, I mean, you know, it'd be. Uh, it's. It's. Uh, uh, I just don't think that's a. Uh, I. I don't think it's a, a. The right thing to do, so to speak. And I mean, for us. You know, we're also just recently, in the last few weeks, actually started selling private cloud versions of our system, which seems to be a very popular thing, um, which is just, you know, you have the whole cloud, it's virtualized, you put it in your data center type thing. Um, I think, uh, uh, anyway, to, to kind of respond about kind of the structure of the language and so on, um, so just to show you a little bit of stuff, so so one of the, one of the big things in the language is it's all about making transformations for symbolic expressions. So for example, if I say something like, if I want to define, you know, f of x is x squared. So this is how I do it. I just say, actually, let, let me not do it this for a start. Let me just, let me, let me do something simpler for, to begin with. Let's say I want to say f of 0 is 10. Okay? f of 1 is 20. Okay, so now if I say what's f of 0, it'll say it's 10. Great. If I say what's f of 2, it'll say it doesn't know what f of 2 is. Okay? If I say f of x blank is x squared, then it will say, okay, blank stands for anything. And the x means name it x. So this says that f of anything and the thing is named x is x squared. So now if I say what's f of 78, it'll give us the answer. Okay? Now if I say, you know, what's f of the list for 5? Um, oh, it'll actually it'll actually give us an answer because it because it was it was allowed to have anything. Okay, let's say if I say f of four comma six for example. Again, it doesn't know the answer, um, but I could then start saying f of x blank comma x blank colon equals let's say you know ten uh, x or something. And now what this will mean that's a pattern that if I say f of eight eight it'll say that. If I say f of u u or something it'll say that. If I say f of u v it'll say I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is because no pattern has been defined for it. Okay. So the whole way the language works is by setting up these transformation rules for patterns. The patterns get very you know much more complicated than this, but that's kind of the idea. And so when you're talking about sort of objects and so on, the typical thing you would do is you would wrap something. Let's call it a g thing. Okay, so then we'd say something like the operation f applied to a g thing. Um, let's say, let's say, yeah, something like this gives you x plus one or some such other thing. And so then when we say f of g of eight or something, it'll give us the result. Um, if I say, you know, f of h of four or something, it says I don't know what that is. So that's how we start building up uh, sort of a structure of uh, the language um, that. Where we where we have these kind of um, uh, arbitrary structures that we can define rules for, and this is a really powerful thing that is basically the way that we construct our whole whole system. Um, and uh, can I ask you yeah, uh, error sure. What would you like to see? I mean, because if I say one over zero, for example. <laughs> 
And why, um, why does it not say anything? That it doesn't understand what's, what's this ex expression doing that you wrote before? Because it's a symbolic language. So it, it, as far as it's concerned, if it doesn't know what it is, it just stands for itself. Okay. okay? Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it says, that's probably not the right thing. One over zero is probably not the right thing. So I'm going to give you some kind of message about it. But if it's just X, it's just, great, that's X. Thank you, you know. And if I want to do, you know, I could say, let's, you know, let's treat X as just some symbolic thing. You know, we can say factor X to the 100 minus 1, or we could say factor, you know, a little piece of red to the power 100 minus 1. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't care. Um, it's, uh, it's just a symbolic thing. Um, the, uh, uh, and, you know, I, I can, um, so, well, let's see. So, so that, that, that's, um, uh, yeah, I wanted, let's see, I can show you all kinds of other things about the language. I could show you some things about kind of interacting with it. Like, for example, there's this notion of a data drop, which is a, a way of kind of dropping data uh, from external devices into the language. So I probably have some data bins defined. What are some of these? Let's find something interesting here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, well, there's one. There's a slightly bigger one. Oh, here's one. Here we go. Um, so this is, this is from a little board that's sitting on my desk um, at home. So I can now say, take that data bin, which has been dropped into by, from this IoT device, basically, and now I'm asking it to uh, read that in here um, and uh, uh, show me the data that it got um, from that. Uh, here we go. Okay. Creation date. Okay. Um, there we go. Oops. Okay. So that, that's showing me uh, things like, you know, it's showing me temperature, pressure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I wanted to, I could, for example, um, let's do this. Let us say, uh, I think I can say start time of this. Um, okay, great. And then let me say, uh, let me say that. And then let me get the corresponding end time. And then I'm going to do a little, little thing here. Let's, let's take that. Let's get end time of that. Um, it's probably a way of getting both of those together. But anyway, there it is. Now let's say air pressure data. Um, and I live in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, so let's get, specify that as a place, comma, and then I want to tell it these, um, uh, that range of, 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 ti of times. Okay, so now what it's doing is it's getting the public data on air pressure in Concord, Massachusetts over that period of time. And now I can say get a date list plot of that. Um, and so now what, it'll, what we'll see is that compared to this. Let's take a look at this one. Let's take that data bin and let us say, let's get the uh, pressure component of that data bin. I think I can do that with this. Um, oops, okay, I need to get time series. Um, so now, okay, there we go. And now let's get the pressure part of that time series. Um, and so now I've got, okay, so now that's my, um, uh, my time series for which I can now plot here. That's the time series from my IoT device. Um, and now I could, for example, try, and it's a little bit of a tricky thing to do, but I could try taking that time series, um, wherever it is, on line, where was it? There we go, on line 118, and dividing it by the time series on, on uh, line 114. So let's say 118 divided by 114. I hope this is going to work. Um, so that should be a ratio of two time series. Okay, it's taking a little while because what it has to do is to resample the time series because it's got, because these time series are sampled in different places. So it's got to do a whole bunch of resampling and hopefully it will figure out um, after a little while here uh, what, what, but you can already see that it's something, something correctly happened because there's the, there's the data from my desktop sensor and there's the data from the weather station and they at least are qualitatively similar. Um, and I think it must be taking a long time. It's, I probably told it to do some very elaborate resampling here. Um, well, let's, let's put it out of its misery here. But the, but the basic, well, I'll leave it for a second. Um, the, the basic point here is just being able to deal with kind of data from real world devices, being able to compare that with public data that one can get from, uh, uh, from public sources and so on. All right, so 
one of the things that I think, okay, so there are a bunch of things that I think are important about this. One is um, that, you know, we have a language here where it's really quite plausible for people to write this language and write programs that people can read in this language um, and to have those programs be talking about not just pure computational things, but things about the real world and so on. I view it as being a language where that humans can actually read as well as computers reading it. Um, and it's a way to actually explain what you're talking about in a precise fashion, um, as well as to explain to a computer what you're talking about. You know, I noticed in writing this, this little book that you know, I have exercises in this book. And at the beginning of the book, um, the exercises were uh, you know, easy to write in English, and then you'd write a little piece of code that does them. Towards the end of the book, the exercises were quite frustrating to write because I knew exactly what code I wanted to produce, but the English was actually hard to write. And it's kind of like, almost like one's writing, you know, something that might show up in a patent or something specifying, this is exactly what you want to have happen, but the code is easy to write. It's just that, you know, writing that in English is not so easy. So, um, that's, uh, so I, I kind of view this as being a, a language for, um, uh, that is uh, a good way of expressing sort of what one is trying to express. And we, you can do a lot of stuff, you know, in, in tiny programs, you can, you can do a lot. I mean, like, for example, if you, um, uh, if you want to kind of get uh, something cute along those lines, um, if you go to the page about the language, there's a uh, Twitter program is, is, is a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, you can get, uh, um, let's see, that's probably a blog about Twitter program. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of programs you can write here that are just um, 140 characters long that do all kinds of things. Oh, there's that one. Um, and there's the, that's shipwrecks, shipwrecks in the Atlantic. Um, or, you know, all kinds of different things here um, that are really tiny programs. And so one of the, one of the points is you can, in a very, with a very small amount of code, you can get lots of interesting things to happen. Um, that's good if you're trying to learn about programming because you don't have to write a lot of code and you can see something interesting that relates to kind of the real world. The other end of this is writing really big programs like Wolfram Alpha, for example, is about 15 million lines of Wolfram language code. So that's kind of the other end of the spectrum of uh, uh, sort of complexity of code base. And there's all sorts of stuff that we've done to support kind of large scale software engineering kinds of things. Um, that's a different, uh, different end of, the, of, of things. And, you know, when, when it comes to that type of thing, you can also, you know, you can run things in parallel. You know, we can say make a parallel table of the you know, process IDs on this computer, do it in th 30, what, 30 times, and now you'll see it launching four kernels because this computer has four cores. And um, we can see that it distributed that computation across, um, uh, across those different cores. So that's the type of thing that, that, um, that you can do. Um, let's see, I could show you all kinds of things um, and tell you about all kinds of things. Value that that adds to sort of the learning of the language. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't use it. You see, I'm blind to it because I don't need it. But th this this thing here is um, uh, this little piece here says um, something uh, is is kind of trying to predict uh, what um, uh, what what you might want to do next. So in that case, it said maybe you want to sort the entries. Um, I don't know what. Um, Okay, it's just asking me a value of a particular key there and so on. Um, this is a thing, you know, if I, if I were to generate, um, if I were to go here, for example, um, this is saying, you know, what kind of plot theme would I like to use here? Okay, so let's say, say I want to use some um, plot theme. Let's try uh, a, a web plot theme here. Okay, so this is now going to synthesize the code and rerun that computation with that, um, uh, uh, with, with, with that, uh, theme for the plot. So this is kind of a, for people, yeah, I'm, I'm completely blind to this. I never mention it because it's, it's um, uh, um, uh, uh, sometimes I use it, but, but um, uh, for people who are just starting with the language, this is a good thing to do. Um, the other thing that's useful is you can actually just type natural language. So you can say, you know, uh, plot a cosine curve or something, and um, it'll go ahead and hopefully uh, go off and, and uh, interpret that natural language and synthesize code to do that. And you can say, you know, add a, a yellow background 
Um, and it'll probably be able to synthesize a little bit more code there to go and go and do that. Um, from language code. But yeah, exactly. Right. We just we just press that and there yeah. it is. Um, yes. I'm not sure if you already covered it. What language is Wolfram language written? Most of it is written in Wolfram language itself. I mean, there's there's a core underneath, deep down, there's C code, um, and well, there's there's C code, there's Java code, there's all kinds of languages underneath. But the the vast majority of the code base now is written in the language itself. And it's it's a big code base. It's maybe 30 million lines or something of code. 30 million. Um, yeah. So the code that you use to bootstrap it, how big is that? I don't know, actually. I mean, it's just it, you know, the non-Wolfram part. Yeah, yeah, I don't know uh, offhand. I mean, it, it's um, it's okay. So there's many different components. We there's the ask. core computational kernel. <laughs> it would be good if we could ask. If I got into our Git system, we have a beautiful symbolic interface to Git, and I could ask that. Um, but that would require that would require that I actually know how to use our source control system, and that's um, <laughs> uh, um, that's not. Ask it about salt where you at. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it will say no. <laughs> but, but no, the, the question of how big the, the actual core C kernel is, um, uh, it's a complicated question because, it, first of all, there's the, there's the computation kernel and the front end. Those have been separate programs for 27 years. Um, and the, the, the front end is actually much uh, less dense code than the computation kernel. I mean, it's a bunch of UI stuff. Which unfortunately we have had to now, you know, in the mid '90s we we sort of uh, gloriously merged all the different versions of our, our user interface, which we used to have separate versions for Mac and Windows and Next back then and X Windows and so on. Um, we managed to merge all of those. Now, to our great horror, we have uh, three separate code bases again: one for the user interface for desktops, one for user interface for the browser written in JavaScript on the web, and one for mobile. Um, actually, even two for mobile, because there's both iOS and Android. Um, and uh, you know, we're back to a horrifying situation of long ago. But so, so there's a lot of you know, low-level C++, whatever it is, Objective-C, whatever, um, uh, um, Xcode, code, what is the? Yes, OK. The, um, and. Uh, and then, um, not yet much Swift code, um, the, a little bit actually. Um, but but the yeah the, um, and then you know and then there's there's a bunch of Java code which we're actually trying to get rid of, um, and uh, uh, you know other other random languages. But then, in the in the computation kernel, there are extra modules that get loaded in through. We have a library link mechanism which loads these modules in. So those are not. Uh, I mean I don't know. The, it's, it's a hard question to answer how much, uh, you know, if we ask it, like, what's its memory footprint right now, um, you know, if we just say how much memory is in use, okay, so it's quite big, actually, 643 megabytes that's using, but that's probably storing a lot of those big images and things that we had generated. Um, I would guess that the, you know, when it first starts up, the footprint is remarkably small, and, uh, you know, we've kind of kept pretty tight software engineering as a result of the days when we only had two megabytes of memory when we were running on a, you know, a Mac SE30 or something. Um, that tradition has, has held through and, and probably most of that memory is storing actual user output rather than storing things that are internal to the system. I would guess it's like 20 megabytes or something is, is actual stuff that is, you know, at startup. Um, yes, please. So is the Wolfram code for this vocabulary accessible to us? Um, not at present. I mean, we for a while we had a bunch of it accessible. Nobody looked at it. It was kind of hard to maintain something which was visible to everybody. Um, you know, we're I'm, one of my little uh, projects for myself is to figure out, you know, how do we get all of the best features of kind of the open world while not having a bunch of the potential problems of that. And so one of the things people say is, okay, we want to look at some code. I don't really have a problem with that. It's just that it's quite a lot of effort to make all this stuff really clean and accessible and so on. And so we're trying to sort of figure out what's the best way to do it for 
you know, for people who have a reason to look at it. Now, the truth is, when we made it accessible, nobody looked at it. Similarly, when we, you know, when we do things with detailed provenance of data for Wolfram Alpha, we got a lot, we went to a lot of effort to do that. You know, there we can count the clicks and nobody looks at it. And so it's very, you know, it's, it's demotivating in terms of going to a lot of effort to do these things. Um, and it's not, it's not, I mean, I don't blame people. I wouldn't look at it if, you know, it's just like, if you believe that it's, you know, that the system is basically doing a sensible job and that we, you know, did good QA, why would you waste your time going and tracing through things? And plus, so you know. The reason I, I look at source code is uh, whenever I'm learning a new language, it's the language itself. Right. Oh, absolutely. So that actually, that's a very good point. So there is tons of source code available for that purpose. So for example, there's the demonstrations project, which has 10,000 interactive demonstrations made with Wolfram language, all open code stuff. So there's, there's tons and tons. And I mean, there's, there's 250,000 examples in the, um, of, of code in the documentation and so on. But that's a good, um, you know, that's, it's actually interesting because I'm really trying to inventory all these different reasons that people uh, kind of, you know, want different kinds of things, and that's, um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very valid reason which I agree with. But we're, you know, I think we've addressed that. I don't think you want to read, to give you an example, you know, when you actually are inside one of our serious crunchy algorithms, it's probably broken into many cases. It's a complicated meta algorithm. These days it has some machine learning front end that tries to decide, you know, which particular algorithm to use. You don't want to read that stuff. That stuff is not that is not useful to learn the language. That is something that was, you know, a highly optimized thing uh, that doesn't really show you what's going on in the language. It, it's just an implementation detail. Yeah, oh, sorry. Go ahead, yes. So you said you're moving away from Java, so I'm just curious, uh, why are you moving from, away from Java, and then what are you moving to? Uh, so we're mostly moving to our own language. I mean, as much as possible, and we're, we're, we've got quite a bit of t uh, compilation technology that we're already using, and we are currently building a very elaborate thing whose target is LLVM. Um, that's, uh, you know, a much more elaborate symbolic functional programming compilation thing, um, and that will be what we will ultimately use completely. You know, what we're using, you know, we have used Java libraries for all kinds of things, whether it's web communication or anything like this, and they, they, they just, it causes so much trouble. There's all kinds of, you know, Java virtual machine horrors, and there's I just, it's 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 just detailed, you know, software engineering messiness um, that we would like to avoid. Um, and to generally, we're moving, you know, to C like libraries, which seems very retrograde, but um, it's uh, you know it's very practical and it's very you know it's easy to. I mean, in our within our company, um, all of our sort of software engineering tools are built with Wolfram language. So we have a very elaborate re release engineering system, which is all built with the language and, you know, builds up bundles of stuff and so on. And our QA system is also built with the language. Um, and uh, actually quite a lot of that is now user accessible. We have, um, uh, we built quite a lot of um, uh, ways to create tests for users and so on. Not quite our full stack of, of QA, but, but uh, which is slightly more complicated, but same idea, yeah. Is the image identify functionality open enough so that you could use it, train on your own image database? In two months, we will have a wonderful solution to that. Right now, you can do it. Um, you can use our generic classify function. It will do a decent job. The thing that's coming in a couple of months uses the absolutely state-of-the-art stuff for doing image identification, and I think it will be, it's really nice. Um, but it's not quite here yet. Um, yeah. If you're open to saying how big is your database? How big is what? How big is your backend database? Yeah, of, of, oh, it's a few tens of terabytes now. Um, excluding, so that's that's of numerical type data. You know, that's the complete, you know, weather data, observations and so on. That's, that's mostly numbers, basically, numbers and strings. Images are a separate, you know, we have a bunch of images of things. That's a separate data set. I actually don't know how big that is. Oh, we also have geographic data, which is also separated, and that's another big lump of terabytes of, of data. But these things are not, uh, these things are actually pretty big on the, you know, a terabyte, these days a terabyte sounds like nothing, but, you know, the web, the text content of the web is not that big either. The text content of the web is maybe 10 terabytes of interesting data. So, you know, the types of, the sizes of data that we have numerically is, is quite, you know, it's quite big relative to what, um, uh, what you would find on, on something like the web. Was, uh, 
Is it, do you ever see a need or a case uh, possible where whatever you have in your club <coughs> could be sitting in my home and I could be playing with it, just doing a lot more computation than I could yeah. go back and forth with the player? Yeah, yeah, right. So, so the first thing to say about the cloud, we have a pretty nice caching infrastructure. So when things have been pulled down, you know, they're cached and we have a prefetching mechanism where we try and predict um, given that you looked at this, this, and this, what will you look at next? Let's prefetch that asynchronously. Um, as far as having a sort of on-premise, um, you know, version of the whole data, uh, we actually have have for several years sold um, appliance versions of Wolfram Alpha. Um, partly that's used by uh, corporations that want to have their private data mixed in with our public data. It's also used by some organizations, like some government organizations, that want to have a version of Wolfram Alpha where nobody sees their queries. Um, yeah, yeah, we have that. I mean, it's right now, it, until very recently, it was a, a big stack of computers, okay? It is now finally virtualized. Um, so we can actually, it needs a fairly crunchy thing to run it. Um, but uh, it is virtualized, so you can, in principle, just pick it up and put it in anything. I think over time, I fully expect that it will be a, a, a much more portable object. The thing you have to understand, though, is it's got to have its data feeds coming into it. It can't, it can't live on its own. It gets, everything gets updated all the time.